Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. It is amazing that we've got you all here and we really, really, really appreciate it. We'll start uh, with Lorne. Lorne, uh, as this whole project started with you, so we will begin with you. Can you tell us how this amazing true story of courageous belief in oneself and overcoming the obstacles? I love this movie, by the way. Um, how did this story come your way and how... Did you first get involved as the head of the team responsible for bringing this sensational score to life? Uh, okay, well, it started with the director, Neil, who I've been working with for the last 10 years. And uh, Neil did a, a show called Oats. Um, it was a collection of short, short films. And um, he had worked with Hans. Uh, Andrew had worked with him. Um, so there was that connection there. So I got, I asked Andrew to come on board with it because of that connection. Um, but the main thing about Gran Turismo was the fact that it was, um, it's the, you know, everybody sits there and goes, oh God, it's going to be a, another bad adaptation. Um, you know, the Hollywood comes in, they're going to do it and it's not going to work. Um, now, Neil's got a great track record, I think. I think he's one of these rare kind of directors that doesn't really, they don't sell out. They'll just simply just not make anything when they don't need to make it, if this project's not right. Um, but the one thing I'd said to him was um, the concept of trying to make sure that this was legitimate by bringing in um, the gay music community. Um, and I had just done, I, I'm, I, I do a yearly show conducting the Game Awards, which is a farce because I can't conduct and I've got a locked neck half the time. So <laughs> I basically have the, have the right hand in the spasm that moves up and like that. Um, but, but what it does for me is just kind of, I'm just very aware of that community. And I just said to Neil, I just said, look, I think there's, you know, if we can get, the, the composers from the games community part of it a it makes it legitimate but also i think more personally to me it gets them into the world of film and it mm -hmm. gets their name mentioned in the world of film mm -hmm. um, and i think there's still a lot of kind of borders sometimes game you know tv composers don't do films i know a lot do but there's still a, a divide and and that was the thing with the game uh, the, the, the game community we've got here and you know with with twitter i i see those that are kind of really established and those that are starting off and those are very vocal and and i just kind of uh, it wasn't a free for all i just kind of i i've been very aware of seeing who's kind of talks a lot and who helps a lot and and some of us have worked together and some of us know each other so it was kind of just really looking at it and just going okay here's a gang that can you know work on a work on a couple of pieces of music that we can then incorporate um it's a very long-winded answer but i think i probably answered all of your questions in one go um <laughs> uh, but, but it, it was it was that it was that it was about wanting to make sure that this was um loyal to the concept of the community and 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 help everybody you know we, there's no reason that any of the people in this interview shouldn't be doing uh, hollywood films maybe you know they don't need to do hollywood films but why not and i think and i think that the game game community for some reason people stay in games and they don't kind of cross over and and the the, the film composers sure do they're jumping around left right and center so uh, that that was kind of that was what the the plan was. Then you've uh, you've recruited the best of the best here for sure. Absolutely, it's brilliant to see you all here. Thank you so much again uh, for joining us, Sean. Over to you, sir. Um, well, can I just say um, it's wonderful to be speaking. So I've got like an assemblage of like brilliant like minds in front of me. It's like a really exciting opportunity for me. So thanks everyone for for contributing my, my first question was um directed specifically to lawn and to andrew which uh, pertains to uh jan's story obviously this is the adaptation of the true story of jan mardenborough and the arc of the movie and his story obviously has got an inspirational sweep to it and i wanted to ask how did the sweep of jan's um real life story influence the tone of the score i think we're going to have a longer conversation is it jan or is it yan 
Mm, yeah. <laughs> You say again, I say Jen. <laughs> Mayo, <Mano>, tomato. <laughs> yeah, potato, potato. Yeah. Um, yeah. Andrew. Um, yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, I couldn't believe that this was a real story. Um, I think I still didn't believe it after I finished the film and I had to look online to see what the whole progression was. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I think that you know he he such an interesting character in so many facets of life that um it really kind of made made our jobs easy um you know of, of course like him being a gamer um you know we we wanted to we wanted to tell like his fear of failure you know throughout the film it's 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 a huge theme just that he you know he's always scared that he's not going to live up to it that he's not going to be able to compete that he's you know, he's just a video gamer and he can't be doing this stuff in the real life. And I, I think that that was propelling that arc of the story. Um, and then also, you know, his is um, the family influence, his dad, his mom, um, you know, and, and them kind of guiding him through that. Because uh, I, I remember Neil spoke to both Lauren and I very early on, early on stages that the arcs were the most important thing of the movie um, and and us being able to uh, split those into about three or four, the, you know, the, the, the racing theme, the, um, you know, the, the love of driving, um, you know, it kind of really brought everything together quite nicely, I feel. Yeah, and I, and I think also... It goes back to about how games have changed. I, th I think that, you know, when we were talking about gaming 10 years ago, there was no, oh, 10, oh, yeah, 10, 15 years ago, I don't think there were many games where people had a kind of an investment in the characters. Uh, I think that's totally different now. I, th I think that there is deep uh, investment in somebody's backstory in the game. So I think, it, it, again, it's the same, it's the same connection. That if you don't connect with your character somehow, you know, it, it may be, it doesn't matter that their dream is to become, you know, a racing driver, it could be a dream to become a, a chef or something. We've got to relate to it somehow. And I think that you can see that connection with games and a lot of the games that the team work on is 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 this, this far greater character development now than there, than there ever used to be, uh, where, you know, it was basically the concept was he's going to go around shooting a gun for, for 28 hours, go for it. You know, it, it's just a different experience now. Sean. Well, yeah, I wanted to bring um, everyone else into the conversation here and ask, look, when you're um when you're dealing with um something as tactile and fast moving as as racing and motorsports, whether it be that in a film or a or a video game, um, I wondered how does one go about matching that tone and how do you effectively create a sound palette for speed effectively? Start with Yoris. Should we go around the? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think that's you know that's really tricky, and I think um, you know you, you can sort of do that in terms of synthetic sound design, or is it percussion, or is it is it tempo? There are so many different ways to to skin that cat, um, and and it, it's interesting you guys mentioning the story of the film and and the driver and. Uh, his, his his sort of ambitions and funny enough when when I got the opportunity to work on this I kind of felt almost a little bit similar in that you know I was someone working in games who suddenly got the opportunity to work on a Hollywood film and so it was that same kind of apprehension of like you know yes I can do this in games but how does this translate to you know a more real life situation of, of working in, in in film so I guess my approach was to basically just throw a lot of different things at it and to to suggest that kind of speed you know, in, in terms of rises into in in in, in the in using synths and things like that, uh, fast moving percussion, um, and and kind of combine all those things together to to create a sort of a sonic palette. Andrew, um, yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, Lauren and I in the very early stages found that you know vocals actually provided quite a humanity to the score and and quite a relatability, and it was just like a new flavor, you know. When we got the first cut, there was probably over 200 songs in the film. It was just song to song to song. And, you know, Neil really wanted to keep things fresh and modern and new. And we were trying to figure out ways of how of doing that, how to create a sound palette that isn't just an, an, another synthetic score that is just, you know, going through all of the um 
different orchestral elements and adding synths and whatever. And yeah, it was it, it was it was a really interesting blend of of um of, of providing humanity to you know a lot of the synths that we were using. Elena. Um goodness, well I've never worked on a racing game, but uh <laughs> I've played a bunch. Um I don't know, it it, it really is like especially when you're scoring in any game, it really is the context of of what it is that you are scoring. Like, is it is it actually, you know, a story driven racing game? Is it just, you know, uh, uh, an emulation of real life racing? Like, is it F1? You know, is it, you know, something along the lines of like, say, the, the latest uh, Need for Speed game where there's a story and there's characters and, you know, all the sorts of things that go with it. And so it really kind of comes down to um, you know what what is what is the emotion of the race is it just the adrenaline of like i am racing i'm going as fast as i can this is exciting in which case you know you can just bring in just like you know a, a fucking rock or i don't know if you can swear on this podcast um <laughs> i hope so <laughs> <laughs> a whole fucking rock band um <laughs> <laughs> with organ and, and you know drums and you know just distorted guitars like you can do that you can have like crazy synth leads you know certainly the Gran Turismo games have had their fair share of that um a lot of games just get like a bunch of licensed tracks they'll you know put them in playlists you know the the Horizon series um uh, Forza Horizon uh gets you know a really great like uh, collaboration with the uh, artists that put together playlists for their games. So, yeah, it really is kind of just about the the emotion and and you know the the purpose of of what the race is is all about there. Helen, <laughs> I sorry, turn my mic off. Um, yeah, what really uh, struck me was um, like when we were asked to do this, it was a very interesting concept because uh, I, I kind of realized when I saw the movie that um, there's very punchy sound design and the music is quite punchy as well. So bringing us into it, it kind of brought the two palettes together and it really made the whole kind of um, uh, sound palette pop off the screen, really. So, um, yeah, I definitely noticed when I was listening to the first um, single that came out, the vocals that are in that single are very much, um, they allude to like a spectators watching a race. So I think every element that comes into this has been, uh, it, it really speaks to the... Um, the love for the game and uh it, it definitely shows on screen as well so yeah, yeah you know i i think that the, the vocal thing that was was mainly with neil's kind of idea but one thing that he came up with again it was a reference um to um fifa because the thing is is that the concept of the crowd contribution about how you don't necessarily you kind of you hear uh, you hear them singing, but you can't pinpoint what the chant is. So mm. it's 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 like yes, they're at Chelsea, but they're not necessarily blue as the colour. They're just doing this, oh, oh, oh. so. There's and Neil had that idea about kind of using that as a as a as a technique um, to to make the audience feel connected to what who's there and watching it because. It's it is a very solitude. Uh, yes, you listen to Kenny G, obviously, before you know <laughs> a race and before going to the gym. Um, but but the thing is, is that it was it you know that crowd kind of concept um, brought it in to that kind of concept of what, what are the sounds that you can use and and I hate to say tricks, but it is but it but it is those things because if you got if it's an action sequence. You're you're dealing against a lot of sound effects and um, you know things like that. I'll oh, shut up, Jason. This is like a BAFTA panel. It's great. We should be charging. <laughs> we should be charging for this. <laughs> um. Well, I didn't do any of the racing scenes. I had a a character theme for Jan. I said Jan in my yeah head. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's just how Sorry. I think it was the two the the, the double ends maybe. Um. Dutch style. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think with, with games and film, there's actually a lot of similarities in terms of, um, in my opinion, the, the proper approach a lot of times is more about subtext and less about the super obvious things. So um, I, I scored an indie racing 
themed film like 10 years ago and it was all rock band me playing guitar bass drums everything live very visceral and what you would sort of expect but that's what the film needed and i mean this theme that i was working on um with lauren who it's been like 12 years lauren i think since we first met which is a little insane um but it was very emotional and it the had only difference is you're dyeing your hair i think uh no <laughs> Come on, I got like plenty, uh, you're, you're plenty of age. Um, it was a very emotional theme that had a lot of vocals in it and also a lot of like electronic percussion. And what I ended up adding was some more um, like layers of emotion, I think. I used uh, Deckard's Dream, which is this very reactive like bendy kind of natural sounding synthesizer especially if you use this little pad that i've got where it's very pitch bendy and it feels like a vocal but it its source is a synthesizer and i thought that was sort of a, an interesting bridge between the live vocals and the track that i'd already received as well as the idea that it was a synth based score um, i think the best kinds of scores that i enjoy at least are really hitting that subtext and not necessarily always doing the obvious thing. Yes, we need fast music during the race because things are going fast and I totally appreciate that. But I think for me at least, I'm drawn towards the the scenes that require a little more emotional thought and can sort of comment in the background, maybe without the audience even recognizing it. Tina. So my small contribution towards the soundtrack was Never recording say small, Tina. Never <laughs> say small. my very important, ginormous, uh, all-encompassing contribution to this soundtrack was recording electric cello from my hotel room because I was on tour with Hans. I can't remember where we were, um, but Lauren and Andrew reached out to me. So uh, for me, as far as the approach to the music, um, I, I think operate from a more uh, very visceral place, which is my excuse for why I failed music theory two years in a row in college. Because I don't think <laughs> about things analytically. It's all about feeling, it's all about emotion. And so when I recorded it, um, I just tried to capture the feeling. I, I have been to the F1 races in Singapore and just the excitement, um, you know, uh, Jason mentioned the word visceral. It's always very, very visceral, mm. aggressive, um, your blood pumping, you know, everything. Um, just this crazy excitement and I just tried my best to you know get myself into that mental state emotional state uh and to to record it so that's um that's basically it for me but I'm just so happy to be a part of this just imagine Tina if you had if you had actually worked hard and passed those exams you would have done something with your life <laughs> <laughs> we, you might, we might not be here talking to you now about, about <laughs> Austin <laughs> Um, if I, if I think back like 45 minutes ago, I think the question was, uh, <laughs> about, uh, sound palette was, speed. Was, yeah. Was, yeah. 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 Well, actually <laughs> I, um, it's, it's uh, shocking and unprecedented to kind of just echo Jason, but, uh, I, I kind of, um, I kind of have the same response because it was clear, um, from the from the sequence that came over my way that this was a lot more about the character than about anything like that um, and I, I also love that kind of that kind of space um, so yeah I wasn't really even looking at it in terms of 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 that that's you usually think well the, the movie takes care of the things on screen you know the if you need if you need um, kinetic energy in a racing movie from the score and because it's otherwise not coming across, then you probably have a fatally flawed film on your hands. Um, and but it didn't. What I loved was that the, the the foundation that was tossed over clearly wasn't even worried about that. Um, uh, but it was also fun because it was a you know sort of a bit in isolation. I didn't really have a sense of of um, you know where this uh, was going to fall. It was just reacting to it kind of a as it as it was, but it was one of those that spoke very clearly as to what its intention was just by looking at it. Uh, didn't need to have a big, you know, elaborate conversation about, okay, this is, you know, the middle of act two, and this is the scene, this is our, you know, dark night of the soul or what it was like. The Q's intentions were pretty, were pretty clear to its credit very much. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, same, same kind of thinking as Jason. I it was like, well, how do we kind of add some Hopefully some warmth, some sparkle, something that makes uh, it feel a little 
kind of human or, or uh, more so, I guess. It was funny because actually my first thought when I checked it out was, well, this doesn't need anything. This is working great. <laughs> and, and so it's like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, but listen, look, a big, a big Mac does the job. Doesn't mean you should you shouldn't move on to to something better in life. It's uh, you know I, I think I think it's I think the interesting thing is that I think that when you kind of look at these pieces of music generally and the way we all write is is sometimes doing something out of context can be more interesting because you can do it and give it to the editor and they they will have a different vision for it far more than we can and. The same with the director; they can all of a sudden change a whole sequence. Where it 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 it, it is more about um, we yeah we you know we know a car goes around in a circle, but but what's the emotional connection to that character? And and probably the the audience is far more educated than they were twenty years ago. Mm. You know they've, they've they've experienced far more now. So it it is about kind of trying to grab grab something which is probably going to be that emotional connection far more than they're treating it as an, an action sequence mm -hmm. sean you had a question about spotting i believe um yes i did um this um addressed specifically to lauren and andrew again and i just wanted to ask well yeah generally what was the spotting process like with with um um director neil blomkamp and, and what was it like uh working with him generally no time there was no time for spotting it was yeah. <laughs> put, the, put the seat belt uh, put your seat belt on and uh that's a technical term seat belt for me i still don't have my driving license so <laughs> uh, and, and, and me that's me as well i don't drive <laughs> um, and uh the closest i've got to driving is that where where i am at the moment writing um i've gone and got an ele uh, electric buggy and it's <laughs> because it's, it's legally uh, legally, it's a slow moving vehicle. It's got a flashing light on the top. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. Um, to, drive, <laughs> to, drive around, to drive around. And my son won't even get in it with me because because if I go past anybody, they start laughing. So, <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, it a, is it a blue light? Can you blue light people? No, no, no it's orange. <laughs> it's, orange. It's, it's, it's orange. And it's a. It's a yeah, it's embarrassing. But anyway, um, um, but uh, what was the question? About work, <laughs> working, working, we, yeah, we spotting, moved past yeah. spotting, uh, didn't we? No, no, you know, we we kind of, we, we they had been, they had, they had been working on it for a while, then they stopped, they came back to it again, and we kind of just started afresh, we st you know, as Andrew said, a lot of songs, a lot of songs. And we, I think we all kind of have worked in this field of where the, there's a lot of song love. Um, and why are there songs there? Sometimes it's just simply just kind of to change it, to have a gear shift, another <laughs> car. Oh. Um, and it, but it's just to kind of push the change, the textures that we have. So, so the spotting really started by uh, writing, but also getting sweets done. And I and you know I, I think everybody on this call, um, I'm going to say, is a fan of sweets. But it really is a great concept of of being able to create and write freely without having the pressure to hit points. But it it gives the director and the editor this ability to be able to kind of understand this is the arc, this is the journey of this whole game or the journey of this whole film, and uh, and then start placing it around and. You know that was the thing that when when we were working on Yan's journey, it is it is that that starts getting randomly not randomly but being placed around by the editor and being placed around by Neil, um, and being uh, you know play, uh, Dave Metzer who was our music ed editor on it, starting to take stems and again it's very very like the game music concept. Um, of being able to kind of have a suite, but it's built with stems, and that one piece can then start creating several hours of interpretations uh, that we as composers we don't necessarily look at. Andrew, 
Um, yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, we really just reacted to Neil's direction, his shots. Uh, you know, the one thing that I really love about Neil and all of his films is how he handles pace. He's able to move a story so quickly. Um, and, and you know, like Gran Turismo's two hours. I feel like it's an hour 15. Mm -hmm. it, it just, yeah. It's it, you're you're on to the next thing, on to the next thing. And I think there are a lot of us who are just we were just reacting to it. We were just reacting to his cuts and and how the story was forming. And you know, yeah, it, we we were in Sweetland for a couple months, um, and it was great because we you know found out what didn't work, um, how not to do things, and then we really started to zero in on a you know a sonic sa a, a landscape that fit the film, um, because you know we 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 wanted to do something a bit newer, a bit different, a bit more fresh, you know, because so many people have done like. Like that rock approach uh to films like guitar you know and and that was the thing like i i i you know i, I wrote i wrote a suite in the very early days it was very guitar pace based and you know lauren neil everyone was like yeah i don't think that that's our character in the film i i feel like that has been done we need to find something new um and we did make a lot of discoveries through um through spotting and you know with our music editor taking certain cues and then well it, this doesn't work for here but why don't we take it into real six oh, okay that actually gives us a, a lot of what we need there and it was it was really just a collaborative effort because yes we didn't have time we didn't have time for a spotting session um and and you know neil was was having to deal with the studio and screenings and and there was just so much going on that you know when, when you have too much going on you need to rely on your team and rely on everyone to figure out all the different possibilities because to be perfectly honest you one person with one mind cannot do all of these things uh, apart from me, but yes, um, <laughs> I, I think the thing is, is that I think also like, T, you know, Tina, it, it's like, you know, she uh, utterly downplays her, her contribution. But the thing is, is that it's like when when there's a piece of music and Austin works with Tina a, a lot, it, it, it's once when a musician of this caliber goes and performs it and you get it back, it's its own identity. And that becomes its own life. And that one melody line that when she was recording it, it's got a, you know, the Vienna Symphony Orchestra playing on top. Um, take that away and you've got a beautiful piece of, uh, you know, it's a beautiful performance mm, that yeah. that by itself can, can, can hit a heart. Um, so those kind of... Uh, you know discoveries that you know we all kind of find when we give it to a musician they 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 give it back is is kind of part of part of the, the spotting really oh thanks lauren <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my paypal account it's fine yeah, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> um, i'm sorry tina have you been standing this whole time I'm standing. Yes. Oh wow! <laughs> oh. Wow, that's amazing. Are you are you okay? Do you need a seat or anything? Are you okay? Are you no, you're right I, standing. I feel, I'm sitting all the time. Am I behind for cello playing? So standing is good. Oh okay. okay. <laughs> and also, it needs to be the same height as a Grammy certificates behind it. Yeah, let's have a look at those. <laughs> well deserved. Well deserved. There we go. There we go. That's better. I want to ask uh, everyone. Actually, this is this is for all of you uh jan has this process in the movie which which actually lawn highlighted earlier about listening to kenny g or enya to to kind of get in the right headspace before a big race to focus him what artists do you all listen to to focus before a big challenge or a big project tina we'll start with you Okay, so because of all the stuff that's been going on around this particular artist, um, mm. I'm like, I don't know if I should say it, but it's okay. Rammstein is my favorite band, hands mm. down. And I think it's just the, the again, I mentioned power, visceral power, aggression. Um, and I think for me, that gets me very, very focused as opposed to relaxing music. Well, even when you go and do like a Sasson symphony, performance you'll still uh -huh. you'll, you'll still go to Ramstein, will you <laughs> no I, I i actually have this um, routine backstage where i i make these weird growling sounds it's like I, and i feel like it's the kind of cycling and yeah generating energy through my body so um yes i growl like a like a animal that's what i do before classical concerts 
<laughs> it's it's good for the soul though, isn't it? Apparently, it's good for kind of like you know your aura. yeah, just getting in touch with our you know yeah. primal side. Yeah, <laughs> Jason. Um, <clears throat> I might be the contrary person here, but um, Pride. usually. Um, wh whatever it is that I'm working on, if we're talking about getting like getting amped up and getting in the right headspace for something, um, I'm usually listening to anything that's that's would be considered the obvious choice or that had been done before in that project. Actually, um, not to reiterate, but this racing game that I did at the same time, I believe the name that it, Jason, had name the a game. racing film. I don't remember what it was. It was a oh. racing film. <laughs> like the soundtrack came out like right when I was starting on my racing film. And I oh. intentionally never saw the film and never listened to the soundtrack because, or if I'm doing a vampire game, I'm the last thing I'm going to do, uh, despite all the interviewers saying, oh, so did you listen to every vampire soundtrack out there? <laughs> like, no, no. I ran away. I was yeah. like listening to like the great American songbook. I don't want to listen to what everyone else has done before because mm. then subconsciously even I'm going to be influenced by that. And I want to have, you know, internal uh, influences as opposed to external influences. However, that is also something that I think comes uh, with the benefit of both age and experience, because a lot of times when you're first starting out for anyone listening, who's, not as far along in their careers as some of the esteemed guests on this panel. Um, you don't have that luxury. You're you're constantly barrarded with external input from the producers, from the director, from the creative director, from the audio director. We want it to sound like this. We want it to sound like that. So I think once that switch sort of flipped in my career and I wasn't getting that pressure, I just automatically ran in the opposite direction. Elena? Oh goodness. Um I don't know. Like I'm I'm very much of the the school of thought that like I I really can't have I, I guess maybe like Jason, but like I can't have like external influences when I'm composing. Like I I prefer just white noise. Like um some of my best inspiration for for writing music is when I'm just in the shower and I'm listening to just the psh, you know the sound and and out of that just kind of comes something. You know, it's it's whatever the wash of noise is, suddenly inspiration kind of comes out of there not being anything around me. So like you know, if, I, if I could be in a deprivation chamber, maybe that would be even more inspiring to me. <laughs> um, but I love to just kind of, you know, to to really take away all of my senses before I can really kind of emerge with with something new from there. Um, and if I'm if I'm playing a show that I'm just listening to the tracks that I'm going to play over and over because I know I'm going to screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> um oh goodness uh if I'm actually working on something I like like Lena I don't actually listen to music <laughs> mm -hmm. um I do uh, every now and again I'd listen to something like lo-fi or something like that on um mm -hmm. YouTube I bring it up and just you know to wind down but if I'm going on a walk I'll, I'll listen to um stuff to cleanse the ears because it's uh it'd be very different to what I'd be writing obviously so um like artists like uh Radiohead um Electric Light Orchestra even Shostakovich you know I'm an orchestral player as well so uh so they're all kind of equal to me really um but yeah otherwise when it comes to actually working on a project I have to keep the ears kind of free um yeah otherwise I'm afraid of like accidentally plagiarizing and that kind of stuff so yeah. <laughs> Austin yeah, I, I find I listen to podcasts directly proportional to how busy I am, uh, where, you know, I listen to a lot of music when things when, a, you know, you kind of have something delivered and you have that little gap before the next thing's really fully off and running. And that's when I listen to um, uh, the most music, it seems, because otherwise I'm listening to, you know, podcasts or like audible. Um, sometimes it's horrible, like I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll be kind of paying attention to it and then I'll realize oh I need to edit some stems and I'll just keep it running and then I'll realize I've been multitasking for the last hour listening to a podcast about like philosophy while I'm supposedly working and as a result I have no idea what the podcast was talking about and I did absolutely terrible work uh with whatever I was trying to do musically so it's a clearly a very ineffective strategy um but it, it does a good job at tidying me over but that said I do go to a lot of live music um and that's just kind of whatever's on deck, you know, so, you know, I can't really curate that, can't sort of demand 
so and so perform whenever I feel like going and seeing them. Um, so the result is you end up getting random little sparks of things that are kind of unexpected, um, you know, just because they happen to be the ones at the Hollywood Bowl this weekend or that kind of thing. So, uh, but there's something different. Hearing it live somehow doesn't feel like the same thing as when you pull up a, something on YouTube or on Spotify or whatever here in the studio while you're working and you're, especially as a composer, you immediately start unpacking um the you know how it's put together what how it's produced there's a lot of things that kind of kick in automatically when i'm in a live show for some reason i never think about that stuff i never find myself trying to kind of dissect it and so i can just be a listener and not really a composer and then and then enjoy music you know hence the whole reason we got into this career and then the next day at my desk i'm not sitting there going how do i duplicate that sound that i heard from 200 yards away like it they just don't those wires don't cross which is nice you can still really enjoy music without it kind of filtering into your you know work and you know like like helen said you kind of inadvertently go hey here's this great melody that i just wrote that someone else wrote that i listened to 10 minutes ago lawn what's your jam uh yoko ono albums <laughs> um uh you know the, the the world of podcasts where were where, where were they when we needed them 10 years ago i just <laughs> it's it's it, it it is amazing it, it's unfortunately all my podcasts have something to do with like you know uh uh you know uh 80s discographies how 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 tears for fears albums were made um and how police albums were made um but you know the, the music thing Austin's right you know it's a difficult thing about you can't choose when you want to go and see a gig and there's a big influences I, I i have selectively chosen in life to eliminate uh, listening to film schools or any soundtracks <laughs> I, I, uh, you know i'll go to the you know I'll, obviously i might listen to the goonies or something like that. but um but I just, I, I have found it gradually harder in my career to really be able to kind of go, just to not be influenced and for somebody to turn around and say, oh, it's like this, it's like that. Um, uh, so I kind of just, I found personally, I don't get any inspiration from listening to soundtracks. They don't help me. They, they confuse the matter. Um, and if anything, I'll just stick to, uh, I'll stick to, I had way too much 80s music um but um or, but you know going back to the classics you know and listening to that because i just i, I do feel that you you're you're going to try to write something that's on trend and, and and if it's on trend it's out of trend by the time you it comes out so i think it's um podcasts about serial killers are, is my warm up andrew <laughs> um so yeah, I mean, actually, when I'm writing, I listen to LBC. Um, just I listen to crazy people call in and say wild ideas. Um, and I don't really honestly listen to it, but it's just something that I kind of keep on in the background. Um, and you know, whenever I start on a film, I always make like a Spotify playlist, kind of like an inspirational playlist, and I stick to music that isn't necessarily melody driven, but more like vibe and everything. So you know, like this one was more, it was more Square Pusher, Aphex Twin, Autecker, like more of this like EDM phase from the early you sound 2000s. like diseases, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. That was like my last blood test that I got back. I never heard of any of these. Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I really don't want to have a Square Pusher disease, that's for sure. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I, you kind of just take inspiration from everything that you have around you to like, believe it or not, I went and saw Beyonce um, in the middle nice. of this. And that like that show was just unbelievable. It wasn't any of the songs, it, like all the songs that she played was amazing. But then she had all these interludes when she had to do costume changes and everything like that. And I was like, oh my God, that's an amazing beat. And then like, you kind of like, just, it, 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 we, it's strange how you pull influences from things that you don't necessarily know where they're going to come from. Yours. Yeah, no, I mean, like, like Lorne, I'm, I'm a bit of an 80s boy. And, and for me, inspiration comes from listening to a diversity of things that might not necessarily be relevant to what I'm doing. So I, I you know, I'm a big fan of Trevor Warren production. So I always love listening to anything that he's produced just to, 
hear the magnificence of how it's how it was made and produced and how that sounds like I love the sound of those those kind of 80s and, and 90s tracks so that'll be one thing um John Adams short ride in the fast machine is just something that gets me really excited and it might not be relevant to anything I'm doing but it's just an exciting piece to listen to uh industrial bands like Nine Inch Nails uh Front 242 um sort of some of the older stuff uh, just to get rid of some of that teen angst. Um, you know, it's it's things like that. It's it's sometimes I'll, I'll create a playlist of things that, that have no relevance to what I'm doing, but there might be a sound or a something or a production technique in there that inspires me uh, to, to try something different uh, and to kind of throw everything at the wall and see, and see what sticks. So yeah, that's kind of my jam. I want to ask now about um about themes and and if we can if we can do this. Uh, in in a few words each, I wonder, but I, I don't know if I don't know if it is going to be possible. So I'll ask it anyway. What is the secret to a good, solid, memorable theme? Jason, we'll start with you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, mate, you're first. <laughs> I mean, a memorable theme versus a good theme to me are sort of two different kinds of things i think a theme can be good and not necessarily be like the most memorable in the world but my 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 starting point is usually just a, i feel like i'm repeating myself but emotional subtext um mm -hmm. what does this theme need to feel like as opposed to how does it sound or is it is it memorable um especially if you're talking about in games like a cinematic or in film or tv when you're underscoring a locked picture um that has a lot to do with it for me. Tina. Uh, simplicity and power. Love that. Lena. <laughs> um, my personal preference is modularity, where it is a versatile theme that you can take apart, rearrange, and do interesting things with um, to expand the range of how it's used throughout the score. Helen? Uh, I'm the same as uh, with Tina and Lena, really, that uh, if you can fragment it and make it, um, uh, give it new meaning, then and then that's, that's a good, good sign. Um, and also, if somebody can sing it back to you, if you have an interval of like a 13th or something, um, unless you have a very, very good vocalist, it's going to be a bit difficult. So, yeah. Austin. Yeah, it, the singability for me is, I'm very lucky that I'm a absolutely just piss poor singer. So I find <laughs> that if I can, if I can manage it, um then it's probably okay because if you know if it's it's like is this a good cello line the worst person to find that out from is tina because every cello line will sound amazing uh you know it's like can an amateur make this sound good it is a testament to if it's working nicely and as a perpetual amateur singer um i i find that's a decent that's a decent gauge i learned that one from chris young who is somehow far worse singer than I, because his singing sounds like <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's like, there's a, there's a theme in there and pretty good. Lord. Uh, earworm. Should I, I don't need to explain that, do I? No, no, that was it. He means Wrath of the Khan by that. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it's, you know, the thing is, it's, we all, we all look everybody here has got a different we may say the same concept but we do have a different meaning to it because there is the reason why everybody writes different pieces of music what is a good theme to you is a good theme to someone else so it, so it, it it is a difficult thing you know i remember at music college i got told that all i could write was cheesy irish film music because everything i wrote was melodic Firstly, I'm not Irish, <laughs> so uh, I so uh, you know being Scottish, I don't quite understand this, but I understood what what the principle was, and they and they were just you know it was a period of time when the concept of a melody was looked down on. You just it was just it's it's simple, and it's not because if it was, we'd all be we'd all be nailing it, and and you know it takes a long time for us to kind of all sit there. And come up with something and it, you know it either hits you or it doesn't but but it's it's um to me it's that it's the uh, you know an earworm that gets you straight away um and then 
I suppose it's got to, another job to do, doesn't it? It's got to kind of work, connect the audience to that character so that throughout the, the story it can come back. But, you know, hey, Jude, that's all right. You know, yeah. you're, it's all right. It's, it's, it's good. Earworms. Yours. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I fully agree with what Lauren's saying. I, I think it's, for me, it's simplicity and emotional resonance. Um, you know, I, I, I really found that, that themes I've really worked on and trying to be really clever with the orchestration and it kind of gets lost. Um, whereas, you know, for example, the theme I came up with for Horizon Zero Dawn was literally something that was written in about 30 seconds during a Skype call. Um, and it just hit the right, it seemed to hit the right tone and the right sort of fight for the character. Uh, is, that, is that what is that what you won one of your Ivan Novello awards behind you for? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and it's well, Julie Alvin, who's who sang on 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 this soundtrack um, for for Gran Turismo as well. Is is that you know, and it's it's that thing you you mentioned earlier on. You get a good musician who interprets that in a particular way, and you you know, and you're away, you're off, and uh, and, and and that really connects with people. But it's it's super simple, and there's you know, there's nothing really to it. But it's to get to that point, and. It all comes from the story and the and the character and what they're going through, and if that resonates with the people listening to it and and with the story, then yeah, you've got something. But it's rare, it, you know. It's it's it, it can feel really easy, but most of the time, it's it's most definitely not. Mm. Andrew, um, yeah, simplicity, good intro, good outro. Love that, Sean. You had a very cool question about being a pit mechanic. Um. Yeah, just before I, I uh, <laughs> before I get into, I just, it's been really interesting hearing about people's inspirations and about what people listen to and earworms. I mean, I was listening to um, Monty Python on the way into work today. That's that they got some good. I was listening to like Brian's song from like Life of Brian. I was like, that's good. That's a good earworm theme. <laughs> and and it's just like it's funny how just inspiration comes from certain places, isn't it? But um. But yeah, um, the the question was, um, in what ways is a composer's job similar to that of a pit mechanic? In as much as how much fine tuning does there have to be to get the engine running? How long did it, here's my question? How long did you think about that question? <laughs> <laughs> I I must have spent all of all of an hour. <laughs> I can't remember actually. Um, ask, kind of... ask, ask Austin first because he's always the last to, to answer, and you can see. <laughs> He's writing down the question. I was I was hypothetical. I was theorizing that you were that you were originally the question was how much like being a DM for a D&D game is writing. And then you were like, oh, no, no, we're going to be talking about Gran Turismo. And then you scratch it out and start it over <laughs> yeah. with the, it, 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 it's, the it's question. Changed it. Yeah, different, uh, different franchises. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. How much is it like riding a motorcycle off a cliff? No, yeah. no, changing yeah. it no, again. No, not that one. Um, <laughs> uh, I, the way I would look at it is there's a really awesome video you can find on YouTube that was that is I don't remember when it was made five or six years ago where someone took um clip from an f1 race from you know current year and juxtaposed it to from 50 years ago of a pit crew turnaround time um and how the the pit crew does everything that they did 50 years ago now in like maybe three seconds i mean it's like this mad descent of people everything about it gets adjusted every tire changed everything and you watch the original it's like five minutes of them going in, there's a guy standing there smoking, looking under the car, like, no, we should try that. And I feel like that's a pretty good, that's actually a pretty good sort of metaphor to how composing has, has evolved as well, where, you know, what, what took a lot longer and was way more inefficient, uh, we've, we've developed a lot of tricks for and pretty, you know, it's pretty, pretty astounding if you A, B them. Yeah, good analogy. Yours, you got Oh gosh, how do I answer that? Um, I don't know really. I think, I mean, to be honest, Austin said it so well that I don't really know what else I could add to that. I think, yeah, I think that's a perfect, a perfect analogy. You know, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of. of <laughs> I like when when I got the brief for for, for the bit I worked on. Um, you know, there was a lot of time sort of spent, you know, for me sort of writing the email saying, well, what about this? And we could do that. And we could do that. We could do that. And I got the politest email back saying, you know, in 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 so many words, just get the fuck on with it. 
just do something <laughs> um you know don't you know because i'm so used to working in games where there's briefs and there's lots of discussion about how this is going to work and blah 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 blah, blah. and this was literally just the case so just get on with it and that for me was kind of is, is a good analogy with the pit stop is just instead of wondering what you're going to do just know what you're going to do and do it as quickly as possible and, and as efficiently and as as good as you can in the time that you're given and just get the fuck on with it so that would be I'm my, gonna get uh, that I'm yeah. getting it on a t-shirt. Get the fuck on with it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Does anyone else have have anything to? Because I'm just conscious of time. Does anyone else have anything to add on that topic or question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I I feel like my experience working on the film was a little bit like a pit crew, where you know this incredibly elegant like F1 up to my studio, and it's like it's tricked out. It's got all of this amazing hardware, and I'm just like, this is a great you and you know lauren had you know sent me a message being like can you just put a little something on there and so you know i was one of those people like that's like right there right you know they've got like the the wheel jack and then they do their thing you know <laughs> and so <laughs> i went in there and you know here's a synth and you know just you know did my job and uh you know and i think uh the track all came together and you know I, I had my little contribution so yeah just like the really quick in and out <laughs> good stuff um worked out well I think, you know, the thing is, is that we're all kind of used to the concept of collaborating and team efforts. You know, we, we, we work, we work in this industry where, where, where the, it, it doesn't, it's not one person, you know, it, it takes, it does take a team. And I think uh, it's about kind of knowing that you've got a great, let's look at it as like, you know, you know you're McLaren, you've got a great car you've got a great driver so to have faith in it and then just make sure you you offer the support and that's really what we're doing we're just simply supporting and whether you know whether we're you know we're adding things to it or we're doing additional music or additional arrangements or anything it's one massive kind of contribution to this thing for the audience so it's um uh yeah you know if you don't like teams you should just get out of the business uh, one last question before we all go, Austin, uh, that we'll start with you on this one, because I know you have to go just finally before we do all go to have such excellence on the same call. Uh, it would be entirely rude of me not to ask what you're all working on at the moment that you can talk about, of course, individually. What are you doing? Anything you've just released, you're releasing things you'd like to highlight or promote or shamelessly plug. Now is the time to do so. Austin, we'll start with you. Well, about as starkly contrasting as this as I could possibly imagine, I just released a musical uh, and uh, an, a video game musical that's branching and sort of ludicrous in its premise um, called Stray Gods. So, yeah, getting those kind of over the over the line in parallel was a, a fun bit of musical schizophrenia. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up actually because i remember you were just kind of developing that the last time i spoke to you so it's awesome that that's now come to come to fruition and, it, and it's all going out in the well. world it's, it's out in the world oh, right now. Th yeah thrilled thrilled people seem to you know there's some subset of people that don't really understand what it is and then there's others that go holy shit i'm in control of the songs uh and uh you know it's crazy it's fun awesome and that's available now yeah it is out in the world Excellent. Austin, thank you very much. Yoris, what do you have? What do you have to promote, sir? What I have to promote? Oh, gosh. Um, most recent thing was probably Burning Shores for uh, Horizon DLC, which came out earlier this year. Uh, other than that, it's it's a typical games thing. You're working on things and you're not really allowed to talk about anything. So, uh, yeah, working on a bunch of games that I can't talk about. Um, and also working on an animated short uh, that's hopefully coming out next year, which I'm very excited about. But again, can't say too much about it at this point, but uh, yeah, that's that's my my stuff for now. Sure thing, Andrew. Uh, yeah, right now I'm just wrapping up an art film um, that I've been working on for the past year and a half. Haven't been paid a single penny, and it is taking <laughs> way too much of my time. <laughs> so yeah, it's called Yesteryear. Uh, you know, the the director Adam Villasenor is a close friend of mine, um, and just about a, a girl losing her mind in COVID. Um, and so yeah, that that is finally wrapping up, and yeah, that's about it. Okay, uh, Helen. What are you working on right now? Um, I have a deadline for three weeks' time, and that's all I can say about that. But um, afterwards, I think I'll take a bit of a break for a week or two. So, yeah, 
but that's important too. <laughs> I'm well impressed. Lena. Oh, I have the benefit of working on some indie games that have been announced. Uh, so <laughs> probably the the first one to come out is a game called Beastie Ball, and it's a sort of uh, what what if uh, you had a Pokemon team that was playing volleyball, um, and nice. it's uh, it's 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 really fun. It's just uh, it's by the same creator that did uh, Chigori, a Colorful Tale, which is a game that I scored a couple of years ago, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Just bringing out all of the classic uh, video game synths, uh, a lot of a lot of chip tune, a lot of uh, Super Nintendo and Genesis sounds. So just really going a classic classic game sounds with that one. And then contrasting, I'm working on Earthblade, which is uh, the next game from the team that did Celeste, which was my sort of big breakout award-winning game. Um, and uh, that is uh, just a huge, huge endeavor, lots of big experimental sounds and synths and, and live orchestra and all sorts of fun things with that. So um, lots of experimentation on that game. Obviously, uh, uh, as well, we have the great privilege of speaking to all of you today at once, but of course, Sean and I's door are always open. We would love to speak to you over the course of the next few months individually, one-to-one, -one, if that would be awesome to do kind of a whole podcast yeah. with, with you individually to talk about these products more as well. Uh, Jason, what are you working on, sir? As as soon as I heard what you're working on, I was immediately like, <laughs> open like, current I drive, scan project folders. It's like, no, 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 no. I always do games, this to you, I'm sorry. You can't talk about anything. Um, <laughs> however... I do have one game with Modern Warfare 2. Um, I've been scoring the seasons for, for Warzone that have been coming out over the last like nine months. And I'm working literally today on the final season, season six that's dropping for um, Halloween. And uh, that's that's been a super fun ride. And the only thing <laughs> that I can talk about at the moment. <laughs> okay. And Tina, you've just been on tour with Hans. Are you still on tour with Hans? How's that working out right now? No, I'm at home trying to decorate my studio to look more impressive. Um, <laughs> uh, we were on tour for a few months, uh, and then I was in Australia a couple weeks ago doing the Australian premiere of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um, I, I, I believe I was the only Asian person on stage, so I brought authenticity <laughs> to the Chinese film. <laughs> uh, no, but in all seriousness, I've, I've, never, uh, I've never played it before, so that was fun. We did two... Uh, two shows in one day and the most difficult part was sitting completely still because for like an hour and a half of the film the solo cello doesn't play anything and I'm like at the very front and trying not to move so that was actually really really difficult and my butt really hurt um, after so we did that I came back um, we just finished recording Andrew was also a part of this adventure for Dune uh, number two um, so soundtrack wise and then now I'm trying to force myself to be a good girl and practice my classical cello because I do have a concert with a symphony in Texas uh, in October. So going old school, way back to like Haydn Concerto and then some nice. like film music stuff. Um, and most importantly, trying to find a better work life balance. So mm. oh, trying to travel. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey. Well, <laughs> share your tips on that one. I will, I will take all knowledge on that, please. Anything that you wish to share? Yes, please. <laughs> Lorne. Have you, have you slept yet this year? Uh, I'm about to. Um, i tell you what I'm working <laughs> on. I'm, I'm working on uh, telling you everybody that's not here. Um, yes, another, please do that. Another, actually, group, yeah. another great team that we had on it was The Flight. Unfortunately, they, they both can't be here, but they, they, they're great composers. Um, I regard them as friends. They... they um, they can make some great soundtracks. I think we, we the majority of us know them also. Um, so they they worked on it. The the musician side, you know, we had Tina, but we also had Chad Smith, a great drummer from the Chili Peppers, whose kids are big gamers. And um, so he appeared on it. And then we had a great vocalist, Judy Elvin, which I know a lot of us have worked with, Jillian Aversa, JJ Hodari, Jake Hart, and Derek Hughes. Uh, it sounds like I'm plugging people, but it's, it's more important. Uh, and um, and then uh, you know, you know, who was basically right behind all of this was Taylor Elton, who was basically kind of a music production guru. That kind of well, firstly, this is she got everybody on this Zoom. Yeah, she did. She did. So that, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's a thank you, thank you Taylor. Yeah. And thank I you, think, Taylor. Yeah. And then uh, Dave Metz, our music editor, that was uh, you know we've we've talked about. Bernard, uh, who who orchestrated it, and then a great team writing on it: Michael uh, Bitten, Michael Frankberger, Taryn Mitchell, Rufio, 
um, who contributed a lot to it sonically. Alfie Goodfrey and um, Kylie Norton. Um, uh, Ethan worked on it with a great, you know, it, it's a lot of people that work on these projects that um, everybody walks out of the cinema and never sees the credits. So um, that's what I'm working on is uh, making sure everybody gets credit. Credited. <laughs> And what a film it is to Gran Turismo. It's in cinemas and theatres now. The soundtrack by all of these wonderful people involved right here in this chat uh, is available now also. Thank you very much, everybody. This has been amazing and it's awesome to have you all here. And I can't believe that you all are here. And I'm truly, truly grateful for joining us. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having you. us. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thank you.